Welcome along to 98 Not Out. Um, we join you on a bit of a sad day for sport in general. We've had uh, the news break today that uh, we've lost one of the greats, John Watson. And joining me to talk about this is none other than Mark Pugac. Looking forward to this. Let's get into it. Hello, Mark. It's a sad day, and we've lost John Motson. Yes, I, I mean, you and I are similar so sorts of generation, and the the reality is, you know, when we're growing up, and there's two TV channels, there's three football commentators, aren't there? Brian Moore, Barry Davis, and John Motson. There's, there's, outside of a World Cup and a European Championship, there's probably two, three live matches a year. That's all there is. I mean, it, you know, there are six, seven live matches a week now. Two, three live matches a year. And so they, the three of them really were the soundtrack to our lives, to our youth, and obviously then with Match of the Day and the big match and so forth. But in terms of a live 90 minutes, that's all there was. So if your team played in a big match or your team were on Match of the Day, Motti would have been commentating on them regularly because that's um, that's how narrow the the broadcast market was. I and mean, it's gone completely to the, uh, to the other end now. And that's why these people... Um, and I know we'll mention Dickie Davis as well. That's why these people were so big, because there were so few of them. That's why there were so few channels. There were so few of them. And so everybody got to know them so well because we were all watching the same thing. We were all watching the same channel at any one particular moment for a big game. Yeah, it's very, very true. And uh, it kind of harks back to those days of... Uh sport just being much more monumental than it is now particularly cup final days I mean yeah we're, you and I are very very similar in age and um you know I sort of think back to being so excited on cup final day it didn't matter if your team was involved or not in my case Palace very very rarely were um but uh the whole day the build-up and then the occasion itself um and, and I think the commentators at that time really did sort of feel the occasion didn't they they did convey uh, and Motti was 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 one, of, was one of those I think from 1979 onwards he commentated uh every uh cup final for the BBC yeah yeah 77 was his first cup final I only know that because it was the famous ah. Martin Buchan 39 steps at Wembley obviously the the John Buckham no novel um but that's but you just said it, the cup final was live. There was an England match live, and that was just about it. It was a little bit more in the eighties, but not a lot more. It was a little bit more, you know. There was a match of the day live a little bit, but 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 nothing like today. So as you said, you know, these were these were monumental figures. Everybody knew them. They were monumental figures in exactly the same way as Peter O'Sullivan and Dan Maskell, and of course, you know, our favourites, Richie Benno and Peter West, and people like that, because there weren't very many of them. Um, and of course, you know, scarcity and rarity uh, brings its own value. Of course, it does because, as I say, we, we you know, we all, we all we all have the same influences. We all, you know, we all watch the same thing. You lead me quite nicely into uh, my next question, which is basically that, um, as you mentioned, those greats sort of the commentary, Mike, um, from from those days that were synonymous with their sports. But as was the case with John Motson, um, a lot of them were very, very interested in other sports as well. And um, not many people were really aware that um, Motti was a huge cricket fan. Well, he's a huge racing fan. And we've got Cheltenham in a couple of weeks' time. I, I saw him at Cheltenham every year that, that I've been. I, I, I uh, absolutely, I always find it really odd when people sort of say to me, oh, I didn't realise um, you, you're interested in that as well, as if <laughs> as if one can only be interested in one thing. I mean, I feel like saying, what, so I'm only allowed to like roast beef and not roast lamb, or I can only like vodka and not gin, or white wine, not red wine. Come on, we're broad churches. The more influences we have, the more interests we have, the more rounded we are. I mean, listen, this is just in sport, obviously, away from sport as well. Then the more interested we are. Oh, he, he loved cricket, and there are plenty of people I know. I talk cricket regularly. In the, I'll tell you what, next week I will talk cricket with Ali McCoy. I know I will. I'll make sure I do. The, the second test will be over. We'll be discussing either 1 1 or 2 0. It won't be a draw unless it rains, of course, because uh, that's the way England play. Um, and we'll discuss what the Ashes are going to be doing this summer. So, yeah, absolutely. I never talked cricket with Motti, I must admit. I did talk racing with him a lot, though. Whenever I saw him at Cheltenham, we'd often talk racing. But but it, it shouldn't really be a surprise to people that if you are 
a sports, uh, you're in the sporting world. As I said, there are very few people I know who are only interested in one sport when it comes to my profession, let alone um, the public. Of course, you know, you're exposed to the top class sport all the time. There's every chance you're going to be interested in it. And particularly thinking about Motti's age, who was 77. I mean, even our age, Motti's age as well. Very much defined seasons, weren't there? Football season ended with the cup final, or maybe home international England, Scotland. Then, you know, cricket season started. Is someone going to make a thousand runs by the end of May was a big deal. Do you know what I mean? That's right, then the yeah. football, you know, then the there was a little bit more of a crossover in late August, of course, but there was a much more defined sense of football is over, now it's the summer. That's right. That's right. I'm just looking, I've got some stats here from Motti, which I, I cannot imagine will ever be repeated. 50 years with the BBC, covering 200 England games, 29 FA Cup finals, 10 World Cups and 10 European Championships. That's not going to be repeated, is it? No, no, no absolutely no way. No way at all. And, you know, you, 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 everyone knows his attention to detail, his encyclopedic knowledge, his thirst for knowledge. I mean, you know, I'm sure people have seen his commentary sheets in the same way that they've seen Bill McLaren's commentary sheets. You know, it's, it's the classic thing when you are, to be fair, when you're a presenter like I am, as much as a commentator, I always described it as like a GCSE history about Henry VIII and his six wives. You need to know everything about his six wives. There's every chance you'll only be asked about one of them. But that doesn't matter. You need to know what about all six because you never quite know when that information is going to come handy. And of course, it might. This is the other thing. It might not come handy on that day. It might not come handy for another eighteen months, but it's already lodged in there. So he absolutely loved all that. And I, I really, I mean, I, I knew him. You know, obviously, I came across him in the nineties. But it was really when um, the BBC for three years lost Match of the Day, which was in two thousand for three years. He came back to radio, did a radio program. Of course, he'd started in radio in the early seventies before he did his famous Hereford-Newcastle match, which was one of his first TV games. He started on Radio 2, as was the old sports network then. And then he came back to radio, and I think, you know, I, I know he really enjoyed that. I know he really enjoyed that coming back to radio, and he did some stuff for Talk Sport as well after he retired from the BBC. So I think for him that was a nice sort of rounding off of what had been, you know, a, such a long and glorious career. Have you personally got a preference for be, being someone that has had very, very successful careers on radio and and these days on television, do, do you have a preference? Uh, they're they're completely different beasts. I mean, they're sort of they're not brother and sister; they're cousins more really. Because, I mean, obviously there is the um, uh, there is the sort of practicality side of television, which is cameras and rehearsing and lights and you know and you know looking down the lens and trying not to look like you've just been dragged out of a bush and all that. Um, but radio, uh, you know, particularly the radio I've done over the years is but you know. A long time on air, talking, some might say filling, some might say talking crap, but, you know, talking on air. It's, it's a, they're completely different beasts, really. Um, they, you know, they require a very different sort of skill set. Now, you are a very, very busy man. And I think since last time we've talked to you, you've been fairly nonstop with huge events. Um, congratulations on your coverage and uh, superb efforts with the Qatar World Cup. Um I would imagine that was a bit that was a tricky thing to to be part of, but I would imagine preparation would have made sure that it was all. I mean, in my opinion, um, it was hands down the best coverage, uh, and uh, in terms of commentary, guests, and your good self as front and centre. Um, well, did it seem different to other World Cups you've been involved with? Yeah, well, well, thank you. That's kind of when we we you know we we did our best. Yeah, I mean, it, because of, because of the background, which is you know, which is obviously absolutely vital. Um, that we said we needed to be. And by the way, I thought the BBC on the first game were absolutely right in what they did. And some people said they went on too long or they were lecturing too much. I thought they were absolutely fair enough what they did on the first game. You know, they needed to put it in context. Whoever had the first match, they happened to have it, <coughs> needed to put everything in context about what was going on and what the background is and what the social situation was. Um, <coughs> and we, we, you know, we had to... You know, we, we had to do the same thing and we wanted to do the same thing. And it was right editorially. It's always about editorial there. And every time it's, is it editorially right? Uh, we had to do that. And then after that, it was a question of when was it editorially right to revisit that subject? Because what we didn't want to do and would have been a wrong thing to do would have, you know, after five days gone on air and go, hello, welcome to the World Cup. And by the way, do you know what this is going on here? You'd have gone, right. Yes, we know that, you know, who's playing left back. But... <clears throat> If, if, if editorially it was right to revisit it, we had to. 
And actually, with the whole Harry Kane armband situation, editorial, it was right to revisit the subject. So we did. And it was a quite a conflicting World Cup. It was very easy to work on. You know, it was very straightforward to work on because everything was nearby. It was extremely well organised. We'd get in very well. You know, as, as um, a few of the pundits said to me, nice not to walk over broken glass in and out of a ground because there was no yeah. drink at the grounds. But the, the, but, but the other side is we know what the social situation is. We knew what was going on behind the scenes. We've all left now. They're carrying on exactly as they want to. And the atmosphere was a little bit muted. And I don't know whether that, whether... There is a direct correlation between lack of booze at grounds and lack of and a bit of a lack of atmosphere. Not every country, but England, France, which was our big, big night on ITV quarter final, twenty minutes ago, I was looking around the ground, going, "It's a bit flat, to be honest." So, who knows what the answer is? It, in terms of a pure, foot, let's say that football tournament taken place in Canada, we'd have gone. That was a brilliant tournament. It's just because of where it is that we'll always have that little bit of a, a little bit of a taint to it. Yeah, but I think lessons learned. I think the, the geographical proximity, the tightness of the tournament, the timings just all seem to work well. And of course, what, yeah. a, what an amazing football spectacle culminating in that final. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, since then, we've seen you uh, with the, the wonderful FA Cup, which is throwing up its usual dramas and excitement. Um, and we're in the bang in the middle of a, of a great um, Six Nations uh, tournament. Uh, I'm glad. I'm glad you say great because I think it's so far with the best Six Nations, uh, uh, arguably, that we've had for a long, long time. I mean, we, we we've got um, we've got we've got France, Scotland on Sunday. I'm doing for ITV. Scotland have never won the opening two games in the Six Nations before. First time they've ever done it. This is, you know, they're going to Paris. They won in Paris last time. It was a COVID game, so you might say it's a little bit different. But, you know, it's for, it's Scotland are playing magnificent rugby. I mean, Finn Russell's performance in the second half against Wales was absolutely off the scale. England's always a story, aren't they? You know, England's always a story. And, of course, they go to Wales this weekend. Thank goodness they go to Wales. I mean, that's an absolute shambles, what's going on in Wales. And I really feel for the players. And I would actually say to anybody, if you read that, I don't think you can blame the players one iota what they've done. You know, almost running out of contract. They're going, well, what happens if I get badly injured in this game and I don't have a contract after that? Who's paying my mortgage? Um, France are always great to watch. France, Scotland and Ireland at the moment. Um, almost favourites for the World Cup. Can they keep it going for another six months? So Italy have got better. Well, they were disappointing at Twickenham. It was a shame they didn't play well at Twickenham. But there's some, been some brilliant rugby. So much to look forward to. And with, and with a World Cup at the end of it. But yeah. Ireland obviously been the Grand Slam before that. Yeah, that game in Dublin, Ireland, France was, was just something well, else. <laughs> it's one of the best games you've ever, ever seen. That There's one of the best games you'll ever see. And then next week, as you say, back to the FA Cup. Um, and that Tuesday, Wednesday night, BBC and ITV have got live games coming out of your ears. I'm at um, Stoke Brighton. Brighton are a brilliant team to watch. And their manager, De Zerbi, is going to the top. He is going to the top. He will be managing one of the big teams in Europe within the next 24 months. No question. Sorry, Brighton fans. And I have a big soft spot for Brighton. Born and bred in Sussex. In fact, you're going to like this. Look what's there. Can you see that? Oh, yeah. Look at that. Yeah. yeah. My Gillette Cup final rosette from 1978. Oh, wow. Sussex. Sussex beat Somerset. Uh, so I'm bored of bread in Sussex. So sorry, does be? And um, then I've got Man U West Ham on uh, Wednesday, which, uh, you know, West Man United are probably, they're probably the club in the best form in England at the moment. Yeah, I mean, they're all stop-start. Yeah. I'm just thinking about that yeah. rosette, 78. Yeah. So yeah. that would have been the, the glory days of Somerset as well, wouldn't it? Was that yeah, it was. Chitton yeah, Garland, yeah, it was. Both yeah. of them. Yeah. So that was the Sussex team of John Barkley, Mendes, Long, Imran Khan, obviously. Spencer Phillipson. Yeah, they won. I think they won by about five wickets. Somerset won the next year, funnily enough. The Somerset got back to the final the next year and they beat North Hans. We've got 100. I That's went to awesome. every final with my dad, literally. From from 1977 to 1986, I went to every final with my dad. It was great. It was like the cup. It was like the FA Cup final, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Oh, big yeah. time. Yeah. And, and was yeah. it Essex in 1980? Can't remember. Thinking <laughs> sort of round about that. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I know. I saw Essex in a few B and H's. I'm not sure. I saw Essex in a Nat West Gillette final that time. Oh no, no. I'm, yeah, I'm getting confused. No, it's a B &H I don't think so. With Gooch. Hey, yeah. you know, there were the few winners there. I remember. Um, I think Surrey beat Warwickshire in a really dull game. Oh, Derbyshire beat. North North hands off the last ball. Do you remember that? I think oh, Mike you know, Hendricks. Fewer wickets lost. Yeah. yeah. 
There were some great games. Some great games. So to quote you from an earlier chat, the days are getting longer. Yeah. There's a little bit more sun in the sky. It's a little bit, little bit warmer. And we've had a fill of exciting cricket, franchise cricket over the winter to keep us going. And the women's cricket has been fantastic. But there are England down in New Zealand. And as we talk, we're just ahead of the second test starting later on this evening here in the UK. Um, it's all getting exciting and the cricketing blood in our veins is pumping. And uh, I couldn't be more, I don't know about you, but I couldn't be more excited for this Ashes series coming up this summer. Well, you and I are both lucky enough to be members of the MCC. And you can corroborate this. For the first time ever, ever, I can remember, I've been a member for over 30 years, I couldn't, I didn't get every ticket I applied for at Lords for the Ashes. No, no, they just said, you're no. oversubscribed. I think I applied for, I applied for one ticket on each of the first four days. One, so, so me, obviously like you, a member, to take, I said, right, I've got a wife and three kids. I said, I'll apply for four tickets. I'll take one of you each of the successive days if you want to come. I only, I only got two tickets. God, I can't remember what days I got because it was oversubscribed. I mean, that says it all, doesn't it? That says it all. I'm incredibly excited. I'm a bit, a, I won't lie, there's a bit of me that's a bit irritated. It's shoehorned in to be over by yeah. the end of July. I am irritated by that. We know it's to do with 100, but that's another debate. But but in terms of uh, uh, what it will mean, actually, what it will mean is with such a concertina series, particularly with the fast bowlers, you are going to need a, I mean, it's turning into football, isn't it? You're going to need a squad. You're going to need rotation. You know, mm. Jimmy Anderson is the greatest fast bowler that this country has ever produced. Um, probably one of the two or three greatest fast bowlers of all time. But not even Jimmy Anderson, age 40, 41, can play five tests in six weeks. You know, and nor can Stuart Broad, by the way. So, so um, uh, just because it just wouldn't be sensible. Um, by the way, I don't think anybody can. Sorry, I don't think any right. of them can. I don't think Pat right. Cummings can. I don't think Hazelwood can. I don't think Robinson can. So that's going to be very, very um, interesting. I was doing a podcast the other day with some students, and they said to me, um, how do you get Bairstow and Brook into the same team? And I said, whatever I said, what, and I, whatever you do, do not even think about dropping Ben Folks. Don't even think about it. We're going to win the Ashes. We need all our specialists at the top of their game. And Ollie Pope, nothing wrong with him, but he's not an international wicketkeeper. Somebody will have to carry the can. And listen, it, it may be that you know a, 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 a Bears or a Brook they play. I don't know, four tests each or three tests each because there are so many good batters or someone's not in form. But you can't, in my humble opinion, do not sacrifice the wicketkeeper. We've been down that road before. It never ends well. And it's not like it's not like there's a bloke who averages 15 with the bat, mm. is there? I mean, a really good 50 in the first test down in, in New Zealand. So um, I think, I think you know, that and Jack Leach has obviously got some confidence, got plenty of fast bowlers. I think it's going to be tremendous. I think it's going to be. I can't. I'm, I'm so. I'm so fascinated to see how England might respond to Basball not going to plan. Let's say in the first few days of the first test. It's interesting. I, I had uh, Stuart Broad on for a chat um, uh, just before he went off uh, to join up with the England boys, and I was asking him about this Basball thing. You know, from from the other side of the fence, what's it like? And he just said. They're all like kids again. It, and he said, you know, it's like when you wake up on a Saturday morning and you open the curtains to see it's not raining and you want to get out and just play cricket and just slap the ball around and run around and energy yeah. and positivity. And uh, that yeah. seems to be, you know, how many times have we seen England teams, England players, England captains with the world on their shoulders? But Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Absolutely brilliant. brilliant. It's absolutely, oh, I can't wait. It's absolutely brilliant. It's absolutely fantastic. And I think, um, uh, where is the, uh, where's the first test? Is it Edgbaston? Uh, second test is Lords. I think it's Lords. Lords. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you might be. Uh, is it Edgbaston or is it Trent Bridge? No, they're not playing at Trent Bridge. I know oh. they're not playing at Trent Bridge, which is a real shame because uh, I mean someone has to miss out, and, and and I know Trent Bridge has missed out this time. So actually, I'm pretty certain it's Edgbaston. Yeah, okay. Because I think it goes. I think it goes Edgbaston Lords, and then um, and then it goes to to. Headingly Old Trafford, I can't remember which way around, and then they finish at right the um, oval. and they finish at the oval. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if you think about it, I was just looking at it here actually. Um, nobody has won. Well, it, it, in this in this century, you had one away win in Australia, obviously 2010-11. I mean, very unusual. And Australia haven't won in England since 2001. Wow. I mean, it's amazing to think that when we went 17 years getting hammered home and away, 
They haven't won here for 22 years. The last series was a draw, you know, and they retained the Ashes because it was a draw. But yeah, I mean, it's it, it's hard to win away. We know we know that from England. <clears throat> excuse me, down under, hard to win away. Well, especially in India for the, yeah. for the Aussies as well. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Both sides. Yeah, both sides. Yeah. Well, we're looking forward to it. Um, and I'm looking forward to seeing you on the TV again with uh, your various assortment of pundits and colleagues yeah. and all the rest of it. And, uh, and and right across all the sports, Mark, really enjoyable. And, um, you know, you are very, very good at what you do. And uh, I thoroughly enjoy your approach and uh, and your manner. It's always really, really entertaining. So, um well done. Well, and, thank uh, you very much. I'm looking out the window, as you say, the sun is going. In fact, my old grey nickels is in the corner of my study. I always keep it here. So it won't be too it won't be too it won't be too long before we're all pretending we're 18 again and we can still hit it off the square. Oh yeah, <laughs> that's right. I'm not off the edge. Um enjoy yeah, exactly. with Ellie McCoist and send him my regards. I'd love to have him on at some point if he's up for it. Um and don't forget oh, we've well, got to get We've got to get Roy Keane down to Lords to uh, introduce him to the world of cricket. And uh... I, I, I'm still working on that. I'm still working. <laughs> I'm still working on that. I'm. St- I did actually mention. Do you know? I did mention it to him. I'm going to mention it to him again next week. Okay, you've got an open, especially Australia this summer. I'll yeah. say, right, come on, we're going to get you to Lords this summer. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> Mapugach, always an absolute pleasure uh, and an honour. And thank you for doing this at such short notice as well. Um, and. Um, all the best. We'll catch up soon. We'll catch up very soon. Absolutely. <laughs>